Welcome to today's Global Connections program. I'm Bill Miller. Today we're going to take a look at a very interesting organization, the East-West Institute. We're going to look at what the East-West Institute is doing to promote a peaceful dialogue between Russia and the United States, as well as to focus upon peace initiatives in North Korea and South Asia and the Middle East. My guest today is an expert on all of these topics. My guest today is His Excellency Ambassador Cameron Munter, Ambassador Munter is the Chief Executive Officer and President of the East-West Institute. He came to the Institute after a distinguished career in diplomacy and academia. Ambassador Munter served as a U.S. Foreign Service Officer for nearly three decades, having served in some of the most conflict-ridden areas of the globe. He was Ambassador to Pakistan in 2010 to 2012 and Ambassador to Serbia in 2007 to 2009. Ambassador Munter, welcome to today's Global Connections program. Bill, it's an honor to be here. Thanks for the opportunity. I appreciate you being with me today. Let's start right at the top. What is the East-West Institute? When was it formed? Why was it formed? The East-West Institute is a private organization. It's a nonprofit based in New York. We have offices in Moscow, in Brussels, and representation really around the world. It was founded in 1980 by John Rose, an American citizen who's a bit of a visionary, a man who said what we want to create is the situation within which people can build trust and deliver solutions. So we're not a kind of a think tank that writes books that people read. We get involved in discussions, whether back channel discussions, public discussions, on a wide variety of topics around the world. Add one more thing that our board is global, that even though we're based in New York, we have uh, board members from China, from Russia, from India, from Pakistan and Europe, mm -hmm. so that we believe we have a global perspective. Mm -hmm. And our viewers can go to your website at eastwest.ngo right. and get much more information about what you're doing. You have been quoted as saying that there's a new diplomacy, diplomacy and I got to thinking about that. I thought the old Cold War world is over. Years ago when the USSR and the, the US chose their allies, went in separate directions, fought the Cold War in the Security Council of the United Nations, figuratively, not literally. But those days are gone. We're living in a new era. What is, what is your definition of a new diplomacy and what was the old diplomacy? Was, there was more to it than what I said, I'm sure. Sure, I mean, it's a complex subject, but to put it down in very simple terms, the traditional what we call Westphalian diplomacy, which is mm -hmm. diplomacy run by officials out of capitals, talking with other capitals, and working in traditional multilateral settings like the UN was and remains sufficient, uh, insufficient to deal with the problems in the 21st century. Until the 21st century, there was always the argument, we can solve this by putting a couple of guys together in a room with chandeliers and make a deal. Now we have new problems and new participants, and that's the essence of the new diplomacy. The new is not only the new problems, transnational problems that cross borders from climate change to proliferation to uh, migration, issues like that, but in addition, new players. And new players means that in diplomacy, not only representatives of governments, but representatives of business, other institutions, universities, multilateral organizations, but also NGOs take part in trying to contribute to a situation in which people can address problems and try to solve them, not just in the traditional ways. And th that's what we have to look at. How Really, how prominent is, is it to today that we have so many non-state actors that mm -hmm. are out there? We have terrorist groups, we have other entities rambling around, mm -hmm. rumbling around in various countries. How, how severe is that problem? Well, it's an issue, but let's remember that non-state actors are also good guys. True. E East-West Institute. both ways. East-West Institute's a non-state <laughs> actor. But you also have ISIS. You have other people. You can't just assume that some deal cut between, say, a French diplomat and an English diplomat, like in 1916 uh, or 17, is going to stick. So part of it is getting consensus, getting constituencies mm -hmm. together, so that when you deal with a problem like a non-state actor like ISIS, well, that's not just a question of a military campaign. It's a question of how are we going to rebuild Mosul? How are we going to rebuild Aleppo? That's going to take money. It's going to take buy-in from governments and from individuals. That's what we want to contribute to, a dialogue among many people solving problems that cross borders. Mm -hmm. Now, two of the members of the UN Security Council, two of the permanent members are Russia and the United States, mm -hmm. two very critical players, obviously, sure. since they both have vetoes and both have nuclear weapons. That relationship between those two countries since 1917, you referred to the Russian Revolution, has ebbed and flowed up and down for many, many years. What are you doing at the East-West Institute to help improve that dialogue, to improve the relationship between Russia and the U.S.? Well, you could say what we do with Russia is both short-term and long-term. Long-term, we have a presence in Moscow. We've been there for a long time. A number of non-governmental organizations have left. 
we're committed to staying. We believe the Russian government sees this organization as even-handed. We are very open and transparent about what we do. And we don't, we're not there to come in and give people solutions. We're to mm -hmm. there to try to bring people together to discuss problems. So some of the programs we do long-term are committing to dialogue about counter-narcotics. It's an issue that Russians and Americans share. We're committed to dialogue about uh, counterterrorism, And we have experts from both countries talking. And we bring in third countries, Iran, Afghanistan, other neighbors, our European friends, to make sure that the dialogue is open and clear. You're right that 25 years ago, at the end of the Cold War, a lot of people had hoped that you know, kind of the traditional rivalry would end. Sadly, that hasn't been the case. But I'm optimistic that what we have learned over the last 25 years is that the problems are so complex that we have to see them on a number of different levels, not just government to government. So even at a time when it seems pretty strained, mm -hmm. we're still talking, and we're going to make sure we keep that up. Mm -hmm. Are there certain things that could be done either at the United Nations or by the U.S. or by Russia or by other countries who are involved in your dialogues and your symposia and mm -hmm. your brainstorming and your looking at these problems that are mutual interest to all sides. Are there certain things that can be done now to help improve that relationship? Let me give you an example. We work with uh, Russian colleagues on cyber security. Mm -hmm. Now there's a lot in the newspapers about Russian hacking of the US election. That's not really what we're dealing with. We're dealing with the issues of how to track uh, violent extremism, how to track financial fraud, how to track the kind of the backbone of the way that society works in, in, in cyberspace. So working with the UN, working with other interested countries, the Dutch, the Estonians, any number of other people. We work with our Russian friends to try to address issues that really matter in the context of cooperating with the UN. Mm -hmm. And there have been a number of uh, efforts by the UN to bring people together. We're part of that group. And I think, I think that's where the future of diplomacy is going to go, mm -hmm. that, w that you can address these issues, not just limiting yourself to state to state, but to non-governmental actors like ourselves. Mm -hmm. Now, th th that issue of cybersecurity, I'm glad you brought that up because that is such a broad, encompassing Huge. area and there are so many components to it. Mm -hmm. Are there certain areas that, are, that we don't hear a lot about that we should be hearing more about that pose great threats to societies, not just in the United States and Russia, but around the world? No, absolutely. We're all in the same boat. That's a message that you get when you work at the UN and it happens to be true. The Internet of Things, opens up a whole new set of security issues. It's not just Americans, it's not just Europeans who care about this, the Russians care too. There are norms in cyberspace, the rules of the road. The rules of cyberspace are not really written. Let's see whether we can find common ground between the data protection that the Europeans want, the internet freedom that the Americans want, the sovereignty that the Russians care about. Let's bring all these things to the table. But you are right, it is one of the big challenges of the future and right now, when it's not the top thing people are talking about, we have a chance with goodwill to solve a lot of problems quietly. Mm -hmm. And we certainly need to do that very quickly. We do. Uh, another mission that you, or another objective, I guess you have an area you focus upon is conflict in the Middle East and South Asia. Those are two very hot, hot spot areas of the world. What are you doing in the Middle East and then we'll go to South Asia? Sure, and if I could put that in the context of what we do as an institution, we really have three tasks. We do strategic trust building, we work mainly in three countries, China, Russia, Turkey, where we believe that relationships and building trust over the long haul is important. We work in certain what we call functional areas like cybersecurity. The third is looking at day-to-day -day problems. And that's the third issue that you brought us to and we work in the Middle East. We try to foster, for example, dialogue between Saudis and Iranians. It's not always at the top levels of government, but among media experts, among environmental experts, we get people to talk about common issues. We've tried to work with other groups. We partner with a lot of groups. You may have heard of Search for Common Ground or other institutions to try to figure out how do we get the countries around the Persian Gulf to talk to each other about maritime issues? How do you get them to sit around the same table, not to talk about who they are and what sect they are and what grievances they might have, but what are the issues they have to deal with because they are on this body of water? So we work there, we work in Lebanon, we've worked as honest brokers trying to make sure that there could be constitutional uh, progress in the, say, the selection of the president in Lebanon, we're involved in that. We're going to be working with our Turkish colleagues on refugee issues. So there's just a lot of things to work on in the Middle East, that's just a few. In South Asia, we've tried to work on India, Pakistan, and Afghanistan 
to try to find people who will talk with one another and not repeat the same grievances, whether they're real or not, that has, have come up in the past. We've worked with business people on a project called Afghanistan Reconnected, the idea that Afghanistan needs to be tied by business links mm -hmm. to its neighbors. So we don't have the politicians, we don't have the military guys in the room, we have the business people talking about infrastructure, talking about border crossings, talking about finance, so that we have a common language in South Asia to try to work on those kinds of issues. So those are examples of the kind of things we do in the Middle East and in South Asia, which are trouble spots that need immediate attention. Mm -hmm. We often hear that North Korea is the most, one of the most heavily, armed, if not the most heavily armed area of the world and one of the most dangerous, but a lot of people also focus on India and Pakistan, mm -hmm. both nuclear powers and the fragility of the political situation there, the mm -hmm. economic situation, just all across the board. There are a lot of challenges in that area of the world. Do you bring in this nuclear component? Do you talk about that? We, we haven't actually <coughs> dealt with the nuclear component as a topic, but mm -hmm. we do try to sponsor talks where, say, uh, uh, military experts from both countries get together. And inevitably, nuclear security is a piece of what they talk about. So in many ways, you could describe the work we do as kind of, if you use a pool analogy, like bank shots, mm -hmm. where you try to say, we will talk about counter-narcotics, with Russians and Iranians, but really then that gets the Russians and the Americans at the table. We can talk about military to military, but that bank shot gets nuclear issues to the table. So we try to use the trust and the format of getting people together to take on these very tough issues. Now on the question of North Korea, this is, this is an enormous issue, and we frankly at East West, we're small enough, we don't have ties to North Korea. But we do have trust and we do have relationships with China. So we do our best to try to bring the Americans and the Chinese together with the Japanese if we can, with Southeast Asians if we can, to try to find common ground about North Korea. Mm -hmm. It's a disturbing place for many of us who worked, I worked as a diplomat in Europe for many years, where there's a very well-developed multilateral architecture. You can talk through the EU, you can talk through the Baltic Council, you can talk through NATO. They don't have those kinds of institutions in Northeast Asia. So part of the reason you need the new diplomacy is that the structures that would bring people to the table are absent. And that's why I think it's so dangerous. You don't have the structures to keep everything uh, on track around North Korea. We're mm -hmm. doing our best to try to create that. Mm -hmm. Well, you're watching Global Connections Television, which is a privately funded, independently produced program. The opinions expressed on Global Connections are solely those of the moderator and his guests. We would invite our viewers to go to our website at www.globalconnectionstelevision.com to view previous programs. Also, if you're involved with any type of PBS or community access television station, or perhaps an educational institution that has an intra-campus television hookup, or you just have a website and you'd like to share our programs, please feel free to do so. Global Connections Television is provided free of charge as a public service to help us better understand international issues and how they impact our lives. Today we're taking a look at a very interesting organization, the East-West Institute, and my guest is an expert on these issues and the organization. My guest is His Excellency Ambassador Cameron Munter, who has, is the CEO and President of the East-West Institute. And you have also, Ambassador, served as Ambassador to Pakistan from 2010 to 2012. And you've been involved in a variety of other hotspots, and I hope we can get into them. But while we're talking about hotspots, let's move over to North Korea and Iran. I, those, we uh, see the nuclear programs in both of those countries, uh, especially in North Korea, more so than Iran, after mm -hmm. the, the Iranian nuclear arrangement. What is, what is the situation, which will probably change in about 10 minutes, but what is the situation in North Korea at this point, and what are you doing to try to help resolve some of that tension and reduce the the conflict in that area? You know, a lot of what <coughs> experts talk about are the, the questions of developing a nuclear weapon and uh, ballistic missiles and throw weights, and these are the kind of expert opinions that we leave to others. What we try to do is figure out what are the motivations, what in a way is the psychology of the leadership of a country, say, in North Korea, where you have, you know, figuring out Kim Jong-un. What about the leadership in a country in uh, uh, Iran, which has a, a very vibrant kind of uh, public sector and, and one that I believe is not as well understood as it might be. Building on understanding, trite as that sometimes sounds when you're saying it, allows you to make calculations about what is in the interest of the other country, seeing it from the other country's point of view, so that negotiations 
are likely to be mutual rather than simply exchanging ideas between people who don't understand each other. It's a, it's a difficult thing to pin down in specifics, but what we try to do is bring people together so that the, the, the motivations of leaders are clear so that the experts in putting together uh, programs where they can talk about ballistic missiles or nuclear weapons or, the, or, or proliferation have an idea what their adversaries are thinking. That's what we're working on, and we're not the only ones. Mm -hmm. Now, in 2015, <coughs> excuse me, the um, permanent five members of the UN Security Council plus Germany and involvement from the European Union and other groups like that worked out the Iranian nuclear deal, and which is actually holding at this point. Iran is not developing its nuclear program. Mm -hmm. How has that deal helped to make, uh, maybe pave the way for discussions with your folks? I know you're not directly involved in the nuclear deal, but how has that helped to maybe make people more receptive to uh, getting together to talking about some of these problems, not to maybe be as adversarial. Well, that's right. <coughs> if, you're, if you're trying to take that big issue off the table, which I think was the impetus behind the nuclear deal, it allows you then to address other kinds of issues that matter to these countries. I may have mentioned to you counter narcotics. It's a big issue in Iran. They're right next door to Afghanistan. It's an international issue. You can't solve it on your own. When you have the ability to build discussion, and there's a sufficient trust that the big issue, the nuclear issue, is off the table, at least temporarily, then you can at least try to talk about, say, a social issue like counter-narcotics, economic issues, growth, um, relations with neighbors, and, and things of that sort. So yes, you're absolutely right. The setting is crucial. And the setting that I believe was created by the nuclear deal has allowed us to have a more fruitful and a broader dialogue with Iran. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping that that'll continue and that we'll be able to spread in many other ways and that the new diplomacy will get down to the <coughs> level of uh, citizens having contact with each other so that mm -hmm. that, that notion of the other becomes less threatening. Mm -hmm. And the citizens' diplomacy is very effective. We've mm -hmm. seen that work in many cases, especially during the Cold War, sure. where you had sister cities programs, you had people to people programs, you had people who have common aspirations, common goals, sure. talking to one another, and not really worrying too much about the ideology or the philosophy or right. setting up hard positions. Sure, I would add that you know <coughs> when you have the deal, like the nuclear deal, precisely as you say, it paves <coughs> the way for those mm -hmm. civic initiatives, those com parts of new diplomacy, to really make a difference. If you're busy only talking about a nuclear area, and I would argue that we're kind of in that situation with the North Koreans, you don't have the contribution of civic initiatives which are badly needed. Mm -hmm. Now, in uh, 2015, the United Nations, the 193 countries of the General Assembly, adopted the Sustainable Development Goals, the Development Agenda for 2030. And of course, these are 17 logical, practical goals that uh, will help create a better world to eliminate, hopefully, to eliminate poverty, right. to eliminate hunger, to empower women, different ones like that. You're not on the front line. You're not working like Rotary International and the, the World Health Organization, USF, to eliminate polio. But how did th this whole sustainable development goal concept of overcoming many of these problems, providing clean water, how do they tie into helping you achieve your goals and vice versa? Right. We like to believe that we are part of this group. <laughs> we're not an advocacy organization in the sense that we're not uh, taking care of a direct public health issue like polio or, or hunger. Or, or education. But you recall that the 16th and the 17th goals, which talk about creating a framework for justice, a framework for trust, as well as building partnerships with organizations, they're procedural elements. And I would argue that we, unlike most other NGOs, we work on process. We work on trying to make sure that we have the setting for people to talk. So if people can come together and talk about polio, if people can come together and talk about clean water, if they can come together and talk about the oceans, that's part of what we set up. So it's in a way we're the vessel, and we like to see that other people can put the content in. I think we need both. Mm -hmm. It's certainly a team effort, no Absolutely. doubt about that. Well, it and really we have is. partners. We work with other groups yeah. like, um, you know, I mentioned to you Search for Common Ground. Uh, we work with other uh, NGOs like the German Foundations, the Korber Foundation, or the Adenauer Foundation, or other groups that are engaged in more specific topics. They have the know-how and they have the commitment to other kinds of issues. We believe that we are really on the cutting edge of setting up the situation within which people can talk and we allow them mm -hmm. to do their job better. Mm -hmm. 
now from 2010 until 2012, you were the ambassador, U.S. ambassador to Pakistan. And of course, that relationship has been fragile and is always challenging, without a doubt. Mm -hmm. What were some of the major challenges that you encountered at that time? Um, one of the major challenges <coughs> in when you distill all of the <coughs> incidents down was a lack of trust. <coughs> and what we had is a relationship between America and Pakistan that had gone like a yo-yo up and down ever since the formation of Pakistan with mistrust and, 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 and um, misunderstandings for many years. We hit bottom during my time. We had the Osama bin Laden raid. We had mm -hmm. the so-called mm -hmm. Raymond Davis case uh, where an American contractor shot some people in, in, in uh, Lahore. We had the so-called Salala incident where there were uh, casualties in Pakistan as a result of an American raid. In other words, because we had not gotten the basics down of mm -hmm. trust, mm -hmm. these incidents, which were, which were difficult incidents, brought the bilateral relationship to a standstill. And in a way, that's an illustration of why you need the East-West Institute to say, let's build up that trust. Let's talk about where the common ground is so that when these kinds of problems arise, they don't really destroy the relationship. So we had a very tough time. It was a very tough couple of years. I think Pakistan is on the mend, and I hope that Pakistani-American relationships will be on the mend, but I hope they'll be part of a broader set of issues. Pakistan's future should be part of India's future. Pakistan should work with China on uh, development and infrastructure. These are all good things, and I hope that the experience we had was an aberration mm -hmm. and that we're on to a future of international cooperation in that part of the world. Mm -hmm. Now, as you look over the horizon, look into the crystal yeah. ball, wherever you want to look into, uh, what do you see as some of the major challenges we're going to be encountering? A lot of people say climate change. The scientists sure. say climate change is our number one problem because it's disrupting life all around the planet around the planet, to be quite honest. But what, what do you see? I don't know, you may say climate change, but there may be some others that are out there looming or that you see that we need to deal with as soon as possible. Well, again, mm -hmm. there are different timelines that you work on these issues mm -hmm. in different ways. You, it, the things we do on climate change have to be done now so that we avoid the problem later. Mm -hmm. So setting up the structure of, of uh, debate and discussion on, on climate change is key. I would argue the same is true for cybersecurity. A cyber, cybersecurity uh, collapse could affect the economies of all major countries. There's a broader question that I would bring in, which is the question of governance and the kind of earthquakes that have come through the Western world, the elections in America and in Europe, and indeed throughout, uh, through other parts of the world, uh, have questioned the way that uh, governance works. They've raised the question of honesty in government, raised trust in government, corruption in government, these kinds of issues those are things I think that have to be addressed too. Those are, those are fundamental elements of whether or not people can work together in political situations. So those are the kinds of issues that you deal with. But I will once again emphasize that from the position of East-West, you can't make these concepts too abstract. It comes down to people. It comes down to leadership and people who are chosen as leaders who have to serve the people who uh, in the countries they're in. And if they aren't doing it in a way that's trustworthy, whether internationally or within their own countries, you're not gonna get results on climate change. You're not gonna get results on cyber. So trust in government is a huge element, and I do think we're contributing to that. Mm -hmm. And of course, the East-West Institute is playing a critical role in this. In the last 30 seconds, hardest question, what role do you think there is for the United Nations, UN Peacekeeping, UN Security Council, the humanitarian agencies of the United Nations, the World Food Program, the UN Children's Fund, to help create this better world? I think they've done a couple of things. We have only a couple minutes, but building partnerships are key. You can't have a peacekeeping organization just by sending blue helmets. Mm -hmm. You can't have WHO working just by sending out bureaucrats to talk about things. You need partners, you need NGOs, you need health professionals, you need other armies. So I would urge the UN to continue the great work it's doing, but say there are partners out there who are willing to help. That's where your success mm -hmm. is gonna come from, and that's where the new diplomacy is gonna make a difference for everybody. Mm -hmm. And it is certainly a group effort. No one group can no. do it, no okay. one country, no, two or three or four countries together, it's got to be a group effort. And again, our viewers can go to your eastwest.ngo website right. and get a lot more information about what we've been talking about today. But Ambassador Munter, I want to thank you so very much for a very interesting and a very informative program. Thank you, Bill. Thank, thank you me. very much and great work that you do as well. My pleasure, thank you, sir. I'm Bill Miller. Thank you for joining us today on Global Connections Television. <laughs>